and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are April Damon and actress Fielding Edlow. Author April Damon was born and raised in Hollywood. She earned a Bachelor of Arts in French Literature at UCLA and a Master in Foreign and Comparative Literature from the University of Rochester. Her interest in foreign literature took her to Paris where she continued her studies at the Sorbonne. When someone is from Hollywood, mm -hmm and currently lives in Hollywood, tell us why, <laughs> because no one ever starts in Hollywood and stays in Hollywood. You know, my father was a disc jockey, Bill Anson, in the oh. early days of radio. So we followed him wherever his shows were. He was on Los Angeles radio for a long time, from the time I was born, a little stint in Chicago, and then back to L.A. I've been here most of my life. And your mother? Well, my mother has a colorful history. I love that. <laughs> she was a showgirl, a beautiful dancer, and my dad being in showbiz, that's how they met. But she, she changed interest, obviously, over the years when she grew up and had a family, and she ended up being quite politically active later in life. And, and how was she a showgirl at that time? That was pretty special. Showgirls were, were like very important dancers. and. She was beautiful and young in Chicago. Oh, it was in Chicago? Yes, that, they, they met. met in Chicago. Ah, yes, he was a I radio see. personality in I Chicago. I see, I see, I so. see. Well, what were you doing before writing this book, Exhibitionist? I've been a writer uh, for a long time. I've written radio and television. Oh, you and have. a little bit of film, sometimes with a partner. And so I've been on the Writers Guild. You know, fiction has been my area for all these years. This book is my first foray into nonfiction. So how did this project get started? Uh, and did the publisher come to you to do it, or was, were you motivated on your own? I went and found Angel City Press. And it's a Southern California and a Los Angeles story. I really thought it was the right place to go. And I have to say, she saw, the, caught this vision right away with me and said, yes, really, right away. Patty Calistra. Yes, Patty. Our friend Patty. I, I found my way to this story because it's a you family know, story. Did you know her? No, Patty? no. You didn't know Angel City. But you City. know, when you are an author, you are supposed to do your homework and find just the right place where you think your book would be a good fit. Isn't that what your agent's supposed to do? Well, <laughs> yes. My agent is still on the fiction side of things. So I was oh, so kind you, of on my own with this. Yeah, because that's, that's what usually happens. Authors uh -huh. nowadays do have to go out oh, and help yes. themselves more than their agents do. That's right. And, and uh, because this wasn't fiction, you followed through and did that. I had to. Okay, tell us <laughs> why, why uh, Earl Stendhal? Mm -hmm. He was my husband's grandfather. So it helped that this is a family story. Oh, it is. As a well family. as an art history. Okay. Yes. Tell us the title Exhibitionist Earl Stendhal, Art Dealer as Impresario. And why Exhibitionist? He, that sounds like someone who's on exhibition, not a gallery owner. Well, he put on exhibitions. That's and he it, did I them see. with style and panache. I he see. was the P.T. Barnum of the art world. I he see. did everything big, and he didn't have big budgets. So it was part of his creativity that he was able to create such a name for himself in a short period of time. And how is it related to your family? My husband's grandfather. Your husband's we live in the house now that has housed the Stendhal Gallery since 1945. <gasps> And where is that? It's in the Hollywood Hills, uh, up in Outpost Residential Park. And he had his gallery actually there? It started at the Ambassador Hotel oh, on that's Wilshire. What I thought. And yeah. then went to a big space on Wilshire. But in the mid 40s, right after the war, he found this wonderful home and brought everything to our neighborhood to, to display in the house. And then did he just run it as a regular gallery? It was by appointment then. Uh -huh. It's by appointment now. You know, next year will be 100 years of continuous operation. So Earl, the grandfather, yes. did his son continue? Yes. The, his son was, son was in the business, Alfred Stendhal, I see. who just died this year at age 94. Oh, wow. Al and my husband's father, Joe Damon, were partners with Earl Stendhal. Oh. Um, running the gallery. I see, I see. So it's family it by... It really is family by family, by family. 
did that help in opening doors or were people a little leery about telling you everything in the family? Earl Stendahl set such an example of how to run this business that when his son and brother-in-law came along, they just, they saw how it was done. He was an impresario. He put on wonderful shows, started with the California Impressionists, moved into modern art at a time when provincial Los Angeles was not showing anything modern. Well, well, he, Earl, had another business before the gallery. He was Tell a us. candy maker and confectioner from Little Menominee, Wisconsin, really as was. a boy and young man. It was a family business, too, so I think it was in his blood to so do was a family. A candy business? They were bakers and confectioners. Did he do it here? Well, he ended up doing it here, which most people don't know. In the 30s, the Depression hit him and all business very hard. And art, fine art, was not at the top of most people's list. Right. And so for 10 years, he struggled a bit. He made candy, wonderful Stendhal chocolates, upstairs on the third floor of his gallery on Wilshire Boulevard. And he took artists and clients upstairs to the third floor to see the kitchens, the beautiful candy kitchens. So was he selling the candy in the yes, gallery? Yes, and here's the gimmick. Here's Mr. Exhibitionist. He put on the cover of these boxes color prints of the paintings he was selling, of the great <laughs> impressionists and the modernists. And so you bought your box of Stendhal chocolates with a beautiful color print on the top of the box. So that's, he was promoting even when he was selling candy. That's fantastic because he d did know what to do. I was thinking at the time, who, why would he think there was money in selling California mm -hmm. art? I mm -hmm. mean, it was plain air work yes. and it was, um, as you say, California Impressionist. Yes. But something that wasn't really trendy. He made trends happen. <laughs> he had such a great eye. You know, Al who died, I said, his son. Um, who followed in his father's footsteps, he said, I was a good art dealer. I learned from the master, but I did not have Earl's eye. As a young man... Oh, the eye. Yes. I mean, who opens the premier gallery at the Ambassador Hotel in 1921 when the hotel opened? All part of the hoopla. He was 22 years old. That's why I say, how did he think that there was money in selling California art? There were other galleries at the time. Yes. Cowie there were Gallery. A, yeah, absolutely. Jake Zeitlin was selling oh, art. Oh, right. But Earl Dalzell. thought these... Yes. In fact, he and Dalzell Hatfield were partners at the Ambassador for years. They were in business together. I'm glad you reminded me well, of that. Well, I remember going to the Cowie Galleries, and I remember looking at that art when we were very just married mm. and looking at that kind of work, mm -hmm. but of course opting for something contemporary California, yes. not... Uh, Many of those artists were still living, weren't they? Yes, Guy Rose, William Wendt, uh, Edgar Payne. These were his buddies. They, come, they came to dinner at his house. That's probably why he felt this closeness and that he was able to sell them. Because I think when you have a personal basis with the artist, you have that feeling you can I do something. I think you're right. And again, the, the East Coast visitors who would come to Los Angeles for the good weather, they wanted to buy these beautiful California landscapes. And Earl thought there was a real market, and in fact there was. And who were those clients? There was a long list. I love oh, reading gosh. this book. I mean, I couldn't put it down. <laughs> Thank you. Because it was told like a story. It's, it's told like a novel in a way. That's why I was asking about the research part of it. Yes. Well, well, I was so lucky. We had a trove of letters, photographs, oh. uh, ledgers of prices and inventory of paintings. So I had such rich material to draw from. That aspect of the, of the book was easier than most authors who, who delve into this. Yeah, because you said he lived till he was 90. Oh. Uh, about, he was only 78 when he oh, died. He was young. But he moved through these important periods of art, the Impressionists, the Modernists. Then he got into pre-Columbian art in a big way. Oh, I remember he sold that. to Irving Stone and Vincent Price and Edgar G., uh, Edward G. Robinson. and um, gosh, he, That was the client list I was oh, talking about. Okay. And also people coming from the East, the Hiltons. And yes, the, um, yes, Nelson Rockefeller family um, came out and bought art from him. Did you, did you find uh, the work that you talk about in private collections, at auction houses? Um, because you talk about a lot of those paintings, and I don't know, I'm sure you didn't see a lot of them. But did you research them from those kind of places? Private? Yes, they're still out there. We, we, you know, it's interesting, Joan. Some of these paintings are coming back 
80 years later to the Stendhal Galleries. They still have our stickers on the back. Oh, and we're God. reselling them. People have died. Generations have come and gone in the years of the Stendhal Galleries. And we're reselling some of these canvases. But they're also in, in museums all over the world well, and that... in private collections. And I have photographs of all the pictures. You know, George Harrell took this wonderful Is portrait this of Harrell? Earl. Well, George Harrell also photographed all of his paintings. For he a... photographed yes. paintings because yes, he George did. was always so known for personality. This was a discovery of mine. I didn't realize that he was kind of getting photograph work wherever he could in the 20s and early 30s. Oh, well, he's one of our heroes. Isn't he's he? an icon. George Harrell, when I was working at Interview, we brought, I brought him in to do a series of, of uh, movies, young movie stars at oh, the time who oh. really didn't even know who he was. And in between, I said, oh, George, will you just do a picture of me? And he went, sit there, threw a light up, click. And I went, George, <laughs> excuse me. Uh, he says, I got it. He got it. And I said, no, you need to take more. So he says, OK, another one. So then he sent it to me in a box. And he said, I told you I got it on the first one. And was he right? Oh, yeah. He well, was he the knows. Master. He's yeah. <laughs> you know, the master, the master. So um, tell me, um, when we talk, about, we talk about George Harrell, there were so many other discoveries in the book as I'm reading it. Yes. That's why I got so excited. Yeah. Well, and when you say discoveries, you mean just the way Earl made things happen and yes. found great clients? And, and to know that, you know, George took this I picture. see what you're saying. In terms of my research and being the right. author, oh, I found out things about our family that I never knew before. You know, someone had a drinking problem or right. someone was jealous. It's just family stuff. And when you're in business with your son and then your son has a wife and children and then you have a daughter-in-law. Mm. Can I tell one funny little oh, story? Oh, um, He wanted to sell art at any cost. He was truly a salesman at heart. And he would raid his wife Enid's jewelry box if there was a nice pre-Columbian jade necklace or a beautiful gold piece. <laughs> and she would go to get dressed for the opera. Honey, where is my jade or my gold bird? And he would say, you know, uh, Vincent Price really wanted that for Mary. And you know, I can get more. There's more where that came from. So he would sell anything he could get Pretty his much hands anything. On. Nothing I, was sacred. I think the other thing, and, and just before we have to leave, is the Guy Rose painting yes. with the portrait on it. Tell That's how that I story. start the book. We discovered a portrait of Earl Stendhal in the gallery bins in the basement. Came to discover that there was a painting painted underneath it. And after two years of restoration, it was a Guy Rose, beautiful Carmel landscape uh, that was sold by Earl in 1925 or 26. Um, well, something similar was sold. This is the original painting that was covered up and by Earl's picture. Someone painted Earl. Someone on painted it. over Earl. Fritz Werner, a portrait artist. Oh, you did but figure we, it out. We did figure out who the artist was. Isn't that something? We don't know why Earl would have someone paint his face over a beautiful guy rose. We still have the painting. The thing is, maybe there were a lot of guy roses along. Maybe he had a whole closet full. And this painter Werner needed a canvas. It You're, just that's, said, Here. A, that's a guess that could be the right answer. <laughs> because it could be. he had an abundance of this artist's work. That could be. I don't know. I was thinking about it last <laughs> night when I was reading. Um, and before we do go, tell me what this, the evidence of, of Sendal's um, legacy will be. Yes. I think the way pre Columbian art has really been put on a world uh, map. More he, pre Columbian, you're talking Yes, about. because the later years were, were mostly pre Columbian. And he recognized that as a new form, mm. saw how it was c compatible with other art forms, and was a great purveyor and promoter of pre Columbian art. Oh, it's so interesting. Thank you Thank so you. much, April. <laughs> and don't go away, we'll be right back with Fielding Edlow. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. I'm here with writer, actor, Fielding Edlow, who was born and raised in New York and graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. She's written a number of plays, uh, which were produced in New York and L.A. Her one-woman show, Coke Free J.A.P., <laughs> won Best Fringe in the New York Fringe Festival. Uh, then it went on uh, to be a four-month sold yeah. out. Yeah, then it went out to have a four-month sold out uh, run at the McCadden Theater in Los Angeles. And 
Craig Carlisle directed. Her plays Admissions in New York and The Something Nothing <laughs> in LA brought her critical acclaim. Mm -hmm. Fielding's play Sugar Daddy at the lounge right now um, is described as totally shocking <laughs> <laughs> in its character. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Where do you accurate. get these totally shocking characters? <laughs> well, I guess I love being a nonconformist in that it, uh, um, it allows me freedom and it's more fun for me. And I'm if I'm going to live with this character for a year, two years, or three years, so I want um, to be entertained by her. And for me, that's um, being uncensored, saying things that people think but may not say. Do you play her? I play this character, yes. You play yes, these characters that you want to be with and <laughs> right? to be with all this Just time. for an hour, okay. and then we can leave them in the theater. <laughs> um, I started looking back into your bio and I saw you went to Spence, which mm -hmm. is very she she, and so you went she -she. to Trinity, yeah. which is more uh, kind of um, both private schools. A little in New more York. Uh, brainy. Is Trinity They're, a little more brainy than Spence? I think Spence is more brainy. I mean, Spence is all girls and Trinity is co-ed, so of course I would just get, you know. So did sorry. you find your kid? That, that was my thing. Did you find that kind of uh, uh, attitude? from your characters at those private oh, schools. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I I certainly was around friends and people who being New Yorkers yeah. or t have um, sort of this inbred toughness and saying, you know, wildly inappropriate or just a self-entitlement somehow. Yes. And also there are many aspects, there are wonderful aspects of people who grow up in New York too. I mean, so they're preternaturally kind of more mature, which can be a negative or a positive. I mean, I feel like I was a 35-year-old divorcee at like 16. Exactly, <laughs> you and know? that's why I said, did you find that yeah. shocking behavior yes. in your private yes. school? We were going to clubs when I was, you know, we were 14 years old. You, we were well, you, no business being in this club at 2 in the morning You were 14. on the street? You were, you were on, on the street. street. We were like street urchins. We literally looked like black, homeless, like dressed in black, you know, these... Yeah, dressed in black. Yeah. In but, Houston Street. But that's the thing, like California youth doesn't have. No. There's there's a real yes. difference there until they finally get to be in their what teens, sure. 20s, maybe. 20s, maybe and 20s, maybe. And then it kind of levels out. Yeah. I mean, it was almost like I felt like I was fighting for my life <laughs> in high school. I mean, just I mean, and I was we were very brazen. I mean, I would go back and forth in these little skirts, like on taking cabs, and oh, we were yeah. on Avenue D when it was not there yeah. wasn't a gap. Exactly. Which is now, I mean, it was. Yeah, no, I know. Rough. It was like the really <laughs> tough drug area. Yeah, it was, you know, and what I The mean, alphabets. Skirts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, and there wasn't like these, you know, these stores with like $50 tank tops hanging yeah, in the window. Yeah, well, we were working there. I was working at Interview at that time. Right, so I, read, I, I read your bio, Jen. Oh, thank <laughs> you. <laughs> well, did you take any writing um, workshops? You know, not really. It, acting um, led me to writing. When I, I went, when I graduated UPenn, I went to the Neighborhood Playhouse and I started out as oh, an actress, so which actually is what really, I feel like, only helped my writing because it helped me with dialogue and if, um, sitting in the skin of the character. How, uh, University of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. was a, an easy train ride from New York City? Or oh, you mean the actual train ride? Yeah, yeah, the yeah, train yeah. Ride. <laughs> yeah. We just <laughs> the flying. Train ride. <laughs> we no, jump on I mean, a so metro liner an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah of course I'd be like, I'm bored here. We should just go out in New York. Or you can go to the theater, or whatever. Sure, from there. sure. I see. Yeah. I, okay. Did you teach? Did you teach at LA City? I teach creative writing at, at Los Angeles Community College. You it's do It's one now? of my favorite things that I do, yeah. Oh, it's a real hodgepodge of just the most remarkable people from all different, like I'm an aspiring lyricist or a poet or a screenwriter. Is, is it a real ethnic mix too? Yeah. And do you... Ages, we had a, 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 a high schooler with a 65 year old. But they read, I it's see. all about excavating your story and just not having a, having a free voice. And I think when, when people do that, either young fashion designers mm -hmm. or writers or actors go to a mix like that, yeah. it enriches you and you find yes. more things to write Material, about. yes. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I'm humbled that people would share such personal uh, material. One us. of the things that uh, I've heard you say, or I've read <laughs> you say, that you like just write, 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 write. I mean, you write a lot, and then you have to edit yourself. Yes. And how do you do that? How do you know where to, to edit? 
You know, it's a great, great question. I've become a better editor because what I did before was I would just give my power away and someone would be like, I think you should do this. And I'd go, I know, me too, I think you're right. And I would just, oh, like I would let, I mean, my husband directed the something nothing and he would give me a note and then I'd bring something in completely and he'd say, what are you doing? It's completely different. I just gave you this one note. Oh, is it? So I've swung in the extremes, but I've also found like who who's my inner coterie of advisors that I can go to that I trust, and who and um, and I go well, to playwrights, yeah. and I go to playwrights and writing that. groups to hear my material at different writing groups. Um, can other actors play your characters? Oh, I love that. I, <laughs> nothing more thrilling. I would give me a break. <laughs> They're not autobiographical. The, my mm. stuff. <laughs> you know. Uh, let's talk about Sugar Daddy. Okay, <laughs> all right, let's talk about it, Joe. Let's talk about it. It's certainly, I mean, any writer who says it's completely made up is a liar. Let's yeah, because be, yeah. you have to have your finger yes. in it, don't you? Your touch. I write what I know. Exactly. And I think that my best writing is what I know. It's absolutely um, based on... It's, it's, it's psychically autobiographical. Oh, that's you know a good I, way to put it. That's how I feel because, it, you know, I didn't go on a date with a homeless guy, but I feel like a lot of guys I dated were basically homeless. <laughs> but you talk about an uh, inappropriate father. Yeah, yeah. So I had, you know, there was a specific family dynamic that I grew up with that I drew from. So and my dad is a very kind, he's very successful, and he's very sexist, and he would say remarks, even about my friends. Like, oh, is, it, like, is Annabelle coming over? <laughs> so you like, knew what to write. You yeah. knew what to, you remembered. And your college yeah. and happy mother. <laughs> you know, but a lot of it's, um, I wouldn't say caricatures, but it's just blown out of proportion. But it's based in a truth. But my mother, you know, is actually a therapist in real life and is hardworking and has typical Upper East Side qualities. So you take... You take, take. I extrapolate the, the, the comical. <laughs> For me, I mine the gold. You can go as far as yeah. you want. Yeah. <laughs> but you take the basics and then you. Expand. Yeah, I mean, the character's name is not Fielding. It, it's in the same as my other. But why show. isn't the character's name Elizabeth? <laughs> That's right. Well, because the character changes her name because she wants to reinvent herself. And so does she? Did she's Fielding? trying. Are you asking? Yes, I'm me. asking Fielding <laughs> you. <laughs> me. You know. I don't know about reinventing, but I felt like I wanted to go back to the girl I was that got all mixed up with New York and persona and facades and trying to be tough for this person, this personality magician, I would call myself. So was your real name Fielding? You know, my, my Fielding's my middle name. Oh, Elizabeth is. is my first oh, name. So, so it wasn't like I just was like Meadow. That's call me Meadow. <laughs> call me Flying River. It's That's what I thought. <laughs> I, well, she just found this name out And of you know, it was, it was a family name from years ago. It was Feldman. But my grandfather didn't. They didn't want to be so Jewish, so they so, changed it but to Fielding. And they changed it to a wonderful English name. I know everyone thinks I'm like this pretentious British <laughs> writer, and I'm like, no, no, no. I'm more like Woody Allen. <laughs> but I, I think the way they described it, uh, a biting comedy with yes. calories. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so Cal it has its. It's meat. There's a it meat potatoes. It's, it's, it's hopefully it will be not just, you know, comedy, but it will be moving. But it's, I, that's not up to me how the audience responds. Can but. you bake? <laughs> Can you bake? You know what? <laughs> if they just sit in the seats the whole time, that's I'm okay. happy. Just don't leave. Don't you don't have to bake a cake and then ride Right, exactly. It. You know what? I'll just thank, yeah, just sit in the seat the whole time. Okay, I'll give you a Diet right. Coke. <laughs> so if you were a baker, then you'd be this goody two shoes. In I'm the a horrible kitchen. baker. Yeah, I'm a oh, horrible so baker. My husband's goody. begging me not to bake. Oh, okay, I don't okay. belong in the kitchen. Let's talk about. Um, Coke free. Okay, Coke free. What Jeff. is that? What is so that? So that was character? my first solo show, and that was Sage Saperstein, who was 90 days off Coke and going on her very first blind date with a really nice guy. Oh, that was good. So from beginning to end, to her getting ready with her disco music, but she doesn't drink anymore. So it's like she's this wild animal being thrown she on the streets because no one idea how to conduct herself. Right. So that was a lot of fun. That's what Craig Carlisle directed. And, you know. and um, admissions. And admissions is, uh, it's basically <clears throat> about a Upper East Side family who takes their recalcitrant, slutty, stubborn daughter to Vassar for an admissions <laughs> interview. I keep thinking about you every time you oh, write you? about one of these daughters or right. one of these people. Well, again, I mean, you know, I went to Vassar to look at Vassar with my parents. I didn't go there, but it, I took it from a very kind of a painful <laughs> this moment in time that happened. And, yeah. I'm, and I was like, oh, and it led me to a play. I think that's what's so great, and I don't think people can really understand that, that you just take this one idea yes. and then expand. That's exactly right. It was one moment, a comment oh, my one father moment. made one, that was like a knife that we all have our little trauma incidents, and I'm like, and because it's healing ultimately. 
for me to write. Can, can these uh, plays be turned into films? Yeah, I think so. Do they? People have, I mean, looking? not that that's happening. <laughs> I'm not like, you know, New Line isn't calling just yet. But Are I, you looking for that? You know, for me, and I, a very smart, a wise mentor had said to me, wait for it to be produced. Like, wait oh. for it to go off Broadway and then entertain the idea. But don't do it the other way around. I which see. Then, but it yeah, it's be better. Wouldn't yeah. you rather have it off Broadway? Oh, yeah. that's the dream. And that's what you're that's doing. The dream. Is that where you yes. want these plays yes. to go? So, so they I've come had, from Fringe or they go to The Lounge, yeah. which is a small theater, which sure. is a kind of a... Testing ground, isn't it? I, I think it's a, it's a great petri dish to see. And I had workshopped Sugar Daddy in the Hollywood Fringe Festival, in the inaugural oh, Hollywood too. Fringe. Okay, so, now. Yes. The thing that really excited me is I read the New York Times wedding uh, section. <laughs> you mean the ladies' sports pages? Always. My favorite. Yeah. And I read it, like, thoroughly. It's great. Did you write your own? You know, no, no. Because <laughs> you were in there. What? We had a fantastic writer, this guy. I was like, I want to be friends with him. He, Two we or got three years ago? What was it? How long have you been married? We got married May 18th, 2008. I always have to remember. Okay. And, um, and he, you we, married an actor. I did, Larry Clark, okay. who's, direct, who's direct. Did me and he's a director too, but yeah, he's okay. a great actor. And so here's this great story, the love story, and he has <laughs> to go back to Santa Barbara and all that. Right. I thought, oh, you wrote the story. I mean, it was really unbelievable that my husband missed the rehearsal dinner. <laughs> that I literally, I brought a date. I literally oh. brought my yoga teacher, my gay yoga teacher. I was like, do you want to come? Because Larry's not here. But, you know, the, he interviewed us for a long time on the phone because um, what's interesting is he said a lot of couples had met during Miss Julie, this crazy oh. play. And so he was very interested in that. But um, he wrote a great article about us. And of course, my mother is like, I mean, levitating. And the beautiful picture. And there you yeah. were, the Santa Barbara wedding. And it, was, it, was very, it was very nice, yeah. Uh, well, I'm I, so happy to finally... Find somebody from those pages. Oh. <laughs> I'm glad and that, know that you I'm didn't write your own story. No, I mean they they wouldn't let you. I don't. I mean, well, you you read them, don't you? Yeah, I mean, you read them, and they're like, oh, who could make up all of this stuff? Only the person who's the bride. Right, or the exactly. Groom. Of course, my mother's like, are they going to get into the vows? Like she <laughs> the, like obsessed with the vows, and I'm like, stop it. They're going to pull it completely. Just shut up. <laughs> she, they didn't call her to interview. Oh her. yeah. They did? They called everyone. They called our immediate family. They called the woman who married us. Is that right? Yeah, they, and they, oh, and then they're like, Larry, when were you on Law & Order? And he's like, it was uh, 2001. They're like, actually, no. It was 1999 and 2000. <laughs> like, she, they, she'd they, they, it's like pop right. quiz. <laughs> well, we've got to see Sugar Downey. We've got I'm, to see you in every play. Uh, and then we'll see you on the screen. That would be exciting. Just one thing at a time, Joan. <laughs> one day at a time. <laughs> Thank you, Thank so, you so much. Thank you so much, Joan. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for watching the Joan Quinn Profiles. If you keep writing to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017, we'll write back to you. And email me at jaquinn1 at aol.com. And we'll see you next time on the Joan Quinn Profiles. <laughs>